So for 1.5, there are the objectives there. We're going to learn about what an I is. Um, we're going to learn how to add, subtract, and multiply complex numbers. First, we're going to learn what a complex number is. Then we're going to um, use the complex conjugates, which is something we'll also learn, to write the quotient of two complex numbers. And then, of course, eventually we'll solve complex solutions of quadratic equations. I don't know that we do that in this section. I think that is another homework assignment where I, where I combined 1.4 and 1.5 together. That's when we actually solve the equations. We won't do that today. Um, so we're gonna go through this. We probably will not cover this last one there, okay? So for the first thing, we definitely want to define what the imaginary unit is, I. I is the imaginary unit. And it basically is the square root of negative one. So we know that we can't take the square root of negative one, right? If you type, type it in your calculator, the calculator literally tells you not real, okay? And the reason why it says not real is because it is not real, it's imaginary, okay? So we're going to use that bit of information, that definition to start writing numbers as what are called complex numbers, okay? So in the past, you were used to real numbers. So a real number was just a number. So I could use like the letter A to represent a real number, right? Now what they're saying is if you're talking about complex numbers, you're going to have that real number part but then you're also gonna have a coefficient and an imaginary part, okay? So that A is called your real part. And then that B is called your imaginary part. The I is what makes the B the imaginary part, but the I itself is not part of the imaginary part, okay? So for example, if I have five minus two I, the real part, is going to be five in the imaginary part is just going to be negative two, not the I there. The I is just what makes the negative two the imaginary part. Okay, so in a big scheme of things, and I'm gonna show you this on a um, little picture that I found. So complex, numbers and subsets. I saw an image that really helped to figure out um, how the numbers are grouped, okay? So all kinds of numbers are um, subsets of other numbers. So if you're going to talk about like all numbers in existence, those complex numbers, I cannot get so good um, but complex numbers is a big family of numbers. Right? And if you notice that you have completely real numbers and then completely imaginary numbers, so when you combine them together, you get what are called complex numbers. So that means that. The negative two i all by itself is considered a complex number. The a, right, the five, all by itself is considered a complex number. Okay? Because real are complex and imaginaries are complex. And if you combine the two together, that's complex. Got it? So everything is all complex. Go ahead. So I wanted to mention that because in some of the problems, it says, like, find the conjugate of this number, of this complex number, and then you see like a square root of two. And then people are like, but wait a minute, that's real. That's not complex. It is complex, okay? Because <laughs> real numbers is just a small group of complex numbers, okay? And then I know you noticed um, you can use the other words, especially like in school. You can learn to find out what it's like very high. But rational numbers are basically fractions, okay? And fractions are a group of real numbers. 
And then e rationals are also the real numbers. Um, real numbers. Those are the numbers that can be expressed as functions, like exposures to or constants. There's a decimal that go on and on and on and on forever, and there's like no pattern or anything to their definition. Okay. So those are irrational numbers. Integers we know are the positive and negative whole numbers. So of course, whole numbers is a subset of that because it's only like half of it, right? These are positive and negative, so these are positive. And then natural numbers are whole numbers are zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so to get okay? natural numbers is counting numbers, so it doesn't include the zero. It's just one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and so on. And then here you've got the pure imaginary numbers, which are a very tiny, tiny subset of all imaginary numbers. Okay. So let's see. I just wanted to make you aware of that because you do have some people that catch like wording <laughs> and they're like, wait a minute. Okay. So just because I have defined um, the square root of negative one, if you were to square both sides of that equation, you would basically undo that little house, right? And so then you'll figure out this fact that I squared is actually equal to negative one. Okay. And so then in order for us to put those complex numbers in that A plus BI format, that's actually called the standard form of a complex number. So if you ever write it A plus BI, that's the standard form. And if they ask you for standard form, that's how you wanna write it, the real part in the front and then the imaginary part in the back, okay? Now, just like I had done on my example on paper, that B may not be a plus in the middle, right? The B value may be a negative and then you have a minus there in the middle, okay? So it does a constitute for both plus and minus. Um, so here it's saying to write this number in, stand, in standard form. So you basically have to simplify this into its imaginary form first, and then eventually you can put it in its um, complex form. So when you're doing the square root of nine, let me actually do this one on the paper. What I wanna show you is that what you do is the same as what we did before where we break up those square roots, but you write a negative one. And then for the nine, it would be three times three is the prime factorization, right? So you break up that negative and then you do the prime tree for the number, just like we had done in the previous um, lectures. But it is a square root, so you do need a pair in order to come out, right? And so then you do get the three and you do get the square root of negative one. And we now know that the square root of negative one is just an i. And since this is already in the correct order that it's supposed to be in, right? My real part is in the front and then the part with the i is in the back. So it's already in standard form then. I can just stop. Okay, now they don't show you all of these steps. And if you're working on your test, you don't have to show all of those steps. If you can see, oh, when I take the square root of a negative, I'm gonna get an i. And when I take the square root of nine, I already know I'm gonna get three. So I know that that's three i. Okay, you can do that in your head, going from here to here. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? I just wanna show you why it is that it comes out that way, okay? But you can do that in your head. If it were the square root of negative 25, that would be 5i, right? If it were the square root of negative 144, it would be 12i. Okay. okay, so let's go back there. And what are all these definitions? It says that the number a plus bi is called the complex number. We already said that, and that's written in standard form. We already mentioned it. A is the real part, B is the imaginary part. And then it says when B equals zero, it's just a real number because you need to have no imaginary part, right? And then when A equals zero, it's just called the pure imaginary number because there's no real part. Let's see. And then this is kind of just trying to show you that other uh, image that I showed you, right? Where complex numbers is like the big group and then it has these little subgroups, okay? Um, doo -doo -doo. 
Now understand that in order for one complex number to equal another complex number, the real parts would have to be equivalent and the imaginary parts would have to be equivalent, okay? Right, C plus DI, in order for that to equate to A plus DI, the real part A would have to be the same as the real part C. And then the imaginary part B would have to be the same as the imaginary part C. Okay, that's all that that's saying at the bottom. Now, believe it or not, the adding and subtracting of these things is super easy because essentially all you're doing is combining like terms. You're adding the uh, real parts together and then you're adding the imaginary parts together or subtracting each one separately, okay? But it's not that complicated. Um, so essentially what you wanna do is if it is addition, distributing really doesn't do anything. It just looks like the, the parentheses disappeared when it's addition. But when it's subtraction, you have to distribute that minus in, okay? So notice that if you distribute that minus in, this is gonna become minus C, right? So this real number A, and then you're gonna have to subtract C. And then the, the imaginary part B, but guess what? You have to distribute this negative to this positive D. So now you're subtracting D, okay? Now I don't write down that rule. I just distribute the negative and then combine my terms. I'll show you examples in a second, okay? So the, again, it's talking about additive inverse and it's basically saying, make sure you distribute your minus before you combine those like terms, okay? So let's go to this one. So the first thing they did was distribute this positive. So positive times a positive is just positive one, right? But then a positive times a negative six is gonna give you a negative six, got it? So you have to distribute your signs once you're done distributing, you don't have the parentheses anymore. And the first parentheses never had anything in front of it for you to distribute. So you really didn't need that first set of parentheses. The reason they're there is to group your eyes that this is one complex number added to another complex number, okay? So it was the only purpose of putting those parentheses there. But now that we've distributed, now there's no more parentheses. And then it's just a matter of combining like terms. You can show this step. This step shows you why you can do what you do, but you can just do it as well, right? If you look at the real numbers, you have four plus one, that's positive five, right? And if you look up here, you have positive seven I, take away six I, well, that means you only have a positive one I, right? So you don't have to write that grouping part. That grouping can happen in your head, okay? So here it's the same thing, nothing to distribute on this first parenthesis, so you still get the one plus two i. And if I distribute a positive, it's not really gonna change those signs, so it becomes still positive three and negative two i. And if you group them in your head, one plus three is positive four. And then positive two, my, or positive two i, take away two i, means I'm not gonna have any i's left over. So you don't write them in standard form, you don't write the i's if there's none left, okay? It's like they cancel, right? Just like when you had 2x minus 2x, they just canceled out, right? Okay, here's the ones with the minuses. So I've got three different complex numbers in this problem. I've got this guy, then I've got negative 2 plus 3i, and then I've got 2 plus 5i. So they want to take one complex number minus another minus a different one, okay? All you have to do is distribute those minuses outside those parentheses. So the three I has nothing to multiply by. It just stays three I in the front. But then negative times a negative two is where this positive two comes from. Negative times a positive three I is where this negative three I comes from. And then now distribute the other negative. So negative times a positive two is now a negative two here. And then negative times a positive five I is this negative five I. You just distributing, yes. Foil is when you have two times each other, but this is just one negative times the two guys. Okay, so then you put your real parts together. I only have a positive two real part and a negative two real part. So that means the real parts are just gonna go away, right? They're gonna cancel. So I'm not gonna have any real part in my answer. And then three I minus three I, those also will cancel. 
So all I'll be left with is that minus 5i, which is exactly the final answer. But you don't need to do these two steps in the middle, the grouping, which you're doing in your head. And if you know that things are going to cancel, you don't need to write the zero again. Okay. The main thing is, is distribute those negatives or those positives and then combine the like terms. Okay. That's what I need to see. Um, so they're just telling us that the same rules apply. We still have distributive property. This is that foil you were talking about where you take the first guy and distribute it to all that. And then the second guy and distribute it to all that. Okay, that's essentially what foil is. But what happens is, is that after you foil it all out, you're gonna end up with something here that has an I squared in it. Can you foil complex numbers? So when you have that I squared, you have to make sure that you plug in what I squared is equal to, which is the negative one. So that's the only big difference here between the old school foiling is that after I foil, if I have an I squared, I have to take that out and put in a negative one. Okay, but that's really essentially the only big difference with this multiplication and the multiplication that we did like the first day that we started talking about math. Okay, so. For A, they're doing four, just one number times a complex. And so you just distribute it, you end up with negative eight and you end up with the positive four. There are no I squareds there and there are no like terms there, right? One is real, one is imaginary. So that's the final answer there. Then for B, you actually do have to foil that out. So if you do two times four, you get the eight. we're going to have to the practice so we'll definitely try those in a minute and the same thing for these so the only thing here is that they want you to notice that what happens notice that it's a three plus two i and then the other factor is three minus two i right so they're the same numbers but just opposite signs in the middle that's that difference of squares formula thing right so if you notice if you foil it all out you end up in the end thing to notice is that you had an imaginary stuff and then what do you end up with a real number so those conjugates are super important because anytime we need to have a real number answer we usually just throw in conjugates and then we get a real number answer okay so it's going to come back to conjugates to us it's going to come back in this section when we get to division it's going to come back in later when you get to graphing polynomials, okay? So we will talk about conjugates a few times in this class, okay? But the big idea is to know that when you multiply conjugates together, it just makes all the imaginary stuff turn into real, that the whole thing's real. But that doesn't necessarily the case when you just square something, because notice here that they're not opposite signs in the middle, are they? They're both positive in that one, right? Because that's what a square means. It means that thing times itself exactly, okay? So after you foil all of that guy out and you put in the negative one, you actually end up still with a complex number, okay? So that whole business of turning complex into real is only for conjugates. So of course, they're gonna have to explain all this cool magic stuff about con conjugates, okay? So the real part, notice that the real part does not change sign when you're trying to figure out conjugates, okay? And if you know, I don't know if you know this, but this is something I need to point out for homework purposes. This i is a square root, isn't it? 
it's the square root of negative one. So whenever you're trying to find conjugates, even if there are no i's in the problem, you always want to write the numbers so that it's the whole number part or whatever the real part is, plus and then the radical part. Okay, even if the radical does not have a negative on the inside, you still write it in that form the regular number plus and then the radical on the right hand side. So the i is on the right hand side because it is a radical. Okay, so let me show you what I mean on paper. If I have something like, like this one, where I knew I had that square root, notice that the square root is written on the right-hand side, right? And then the regular number is on the left-hand side. That's the standard form. If I have um, square root of two minus one, that is not in standard form, okay? The negative one needs to be in the front and the positive square root of two needs to be in the back. And then this is standard form. And if I had to come up with the conjugate of that, the real number would stay the same. It's this that would change, okay? And this would be the conjugate. I think I'm spelling that wrong. Conjugate. My G and my J were wrong. There you go, okay? So I just want you to be aware that, remember, real numbers are complex numbers, right? They're just a subgroup of the big family of complex numbers. So even though none of this has an I in it, this is all completely a real, a really weird real number, but it is a real number and it can still have a conjugate, okay? Essentially what conjugates of real numbers does is it makes the little house go away, right? And it, we saw that in the other problem, in the other section. Okay. So when you are dividing, dividing complex numbers. So if you have this, you have a complex number in the numerator and you have a complex number in the denominator. You have to turn this into standard form. And so the way they do that is by multiplying by the conjugate of the denominator. So notice that whatever is down here at the bottom, you're gonna keep the real part exactly the same and you're only gonna change the sign of the imaginary part. That was the same with the real numbers. We always kept the first number the same and then we changed the sign of the radical part, okay? That's how you find conjugates. And so whatever you do to the bottom, you have to do the same to the top. So you're really just multiplying by a really weird looking red one, right? Which does not change the value of the fraction. It just changes the appearance of the fraction. So if you FOIL the top out, you don't need to memorize this formula. You can just do the math and get what you get. Um, but you'll notice that you won't have any more I's downstairs, right? And that's the whole point is to not have any I's downstairs. So that when you're done, you can write it as one fraction plus or minus another fraction with the I on the side, okay? Well, and I'll show you, well, they're gonna show you. <laughs> And then we'll do some practice in a little bit. So here they start with this uh, fraction there. And so remember, you got to get the conjugate of the bottom. So instead of four minus two i, they're multiplying by four plus two i. And they do the same at the top and the bottom. Okay. And so if we foil off the top, we get eight, four i, 12 i, and then six i squared. At the bottom, we get 16. The eight i and the negative eight i are gonna cancel, and then we get minus four i squared. If you plug in the negative ones for the i squared, you essentially are gonna end up with eight minus six, and then here you're gonna get 16 i. At the bottom, this is gonna make the minus four turn into a plus four. And so then you get two plus 16 i over 20. And then all you do is separate that, two over 20 plus 16 over 20, with an eye on the side. And if you notice, let me write that down real quick, 20 and then two plus six i. So I'm gonna show you what they're doing to get that final answer. They're doing two over 20 and then six over 20 with i on the side. And then they're just reducing it. If I type that in the calculator, it'll tell me one over 10. And if I type this on the calculator, it'll tell me three over 10. And so this is the standard form. Thank you. 
the real part plus a number times i. So that's what's weird about some of these books is that eventually they just start skipping steps. <laughs> and I like to try to fill in those little gaps as we're going. Okay. So what do they want me here? We kind of already did this with that first problem where we break this up into negative one times whatever the factors are of that other number. Um, and then the negative will just essentially become out as an I. And so you can always remember that, that this negative right here will come out of the house, but when it does, it's as an I. And notice that the bar does not go over the I. So the I is not in a square root, it's outside the square root, okay? It's just for the sake of complex numbers, they usually like the I on the right, okay? You have to be very careful when you're writing this because um, you can get points taken off for notation. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We know that this negative will come out as an I. And so you have this, right? That's the way I would have written it. Whatever comes out goes in the front, right? But they're saying they don't want it like that. They want it like this. But you have to make sure that it's evident that your I is not inside that thing. I've seen some people go like this to show you that they're closing it. Okay, so just put a little arrow down, like, okay, that's where it stops. <laughs> so that no one misconstrues that the I is inside or outside, okay? Um, if you do it pretty spaced out good enough, you don't have to put that little tag, but it helps just so that I know you know it's not inside. Um, okay, now it does start talking about solving these things. What happens is, is when you get a... Um, when you get a polynomial or a quadratic equal to zero, right? That's how we solve quadratics. The last time we solved quadratics a few ways. One of the ways was to factor it and then set each factor equal to zero, right? The other way was to, um, to do that completing the square process, right? And then you ended up with something squared equal to a number, right? And you could solve it like that doing the extracting roots, okay? So that was another method that we learned. And then the last method that we learned, and essentially what that boils down to is if the quadratic you were given was never possible to factor, like there was no way you were gonna be able to factor that no matter how hard you tried. It was prime is what we called it, right? If it was prime and it couldn't be factored, you have no choice, but you have to do the um, quadratic formula, the A, what is it, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 2ac all over, or 4ac all over 2a. Okay, that formula in there. <laughs> um, so you had to have all of that formula. Now, sometimes when you use that formula, you get a positive number inside the square root, and then you have two answers, right? And in the past, when you would get a negative inside the square root, you would just say the answer is not real and that you'd be done, right? No real answers, no real solutions. Well, now what they're saying is now you have to tell me what the solutions are, even though they're not real, okay? And we do know how to do that because now we know how to simplify imaginary numbers, okay? So essentially what you would do is you would plug everything into that quadratic formula. And then after doing all of this computation inside the square root, you'll notice that you get the number negative 56. And if I break up negative 56, I don't know what that is. Let me see. Um, the negative I know will come out of the I. So whatever it is, it's going to have an I on it, right? Because it's a negative. And 56 is 2 times what? Anybody can help me? 14? No, it's not 2 times 14. Um, 2, yeah, 28. And then 28 can be broken up into 2 times. 14 and then 2 times 7, right? So then that means inside here I get 2 times 2 times 2 times 7. That's the whole prime factorization, right? So then these two guys come out. Normally we put our numbers in front of the i. These two guys are stuck inside. And if I multiply them together, that's where that 14 came from that they have right there. So notice that they have 2. They have the square root of 14, just like I do on the board, but they have the i on the outside, 
right? And it's not inside the house. The little bar stops before the eye, okay? So what they have is exactly what I have. It's just, it looks different, okay? Let me actually, for the sake of the recording, um, let me write what I wrote down on the board. So we had this. We said that was going to come out as an eye. And then we broke this up into 2 times 28, 2 times 14, and 2 times 7. So this group came out 2i, and then these two together made 14. Okay. So that's how they got from negative square root of 56. And then they just chose to write the I over here on the right side. That's the more formal way to write it. I like to write it like this, but when I have to write my final answer, then I'll write it like that. So once they have that, simplified there. Then they're going to do exactly what we did before, where we're going to separate it into two fractions. So you're going to have two over six, which happens to reduce to one third. And then you get two square root of 14 i over six. Remember, only the stuff outside of the radical can reduce. Insides with insides, outsides with outsides, right? So the two and the six on the outside can reduce to one and then a three. But the 14 will not reduce because there was nothing inside a radical to reduce with it. You can also type them in the calculator. If you type two, I'll do it right now. Um, let me put my calculator on. So I can do fraction two. I just can't do the plus or minus. So if I type that in there, you see it better? It reduces it for me. And then you just put the plus or minus in the front, right? because that's what it had on the problem. Okay, so let's take a break. I'm gonna pause the video real quick, just in case anybody needs to go to the bathroom because this is a long class and we're in person now, so you can't just like, you know, you're on mute and no camera. You can step away, right? <laughs> um, do I wanna stop? No, cancel, I just wanted to pause it. Okay, so for the first practice, it's like some of the ones from the homework, um, like problems one or 10, 11, 12, and maybe even some of these other ones, these ones with the I squareds. Um, it's just a matter of making those substitutions. So if I try this one, practice one. We have two plus square root of negative 25. Does anybody know what the answer is by looking at that one? Maybe kind of got the hang of it. You can guess. Wrong answers are just as good as correct answers, I promise. Mm -hmm. It is two plus five a. Because the square root of 25 is five, right? And then the square root of a negative is i but there won't be anything else left on the inside, okay? If you need to break it down for yourself, break this into a negative one. And then if you do the prime tree for 25, it's just five times five. And so then the negative comes out as an I and the two fives come out as a single five. And you don't have anything else stuck in. So you have two plus, and normally instead of writing I times five, we write, we write it like that plus five i. So you can show the steps, especially if it's not a nice number like 25. Um, you definitely want to do that. You cannot do it in a calculator. It probably will not do it for you. Square root of negative 25 is clear. It tells you domain error. So it won't do it. But if you take the i out and you are aware that this negative is an i, you can take the square root of the 25, and now you know what goes in front of that i, okay? Even if it were a weird number, like on the homework, if I, let me minimize this and show you back on the homework. Notice on this problem here, it says square root of negative 99, right? 
And I wrote the answer because I'm already doing what I'm gonna do in the calculator. Um, it's great if you can do that, but if you can't, <laughs> it's okay. You can use your calculator to do it. But I would know that the negative part is gonna come out as the I, and really all I need to do is figure out what that's gonna look like, okay? And so then it does tell me three on the outside and 11 on the inside. And so notice my answer for that is three on the outside, 11 on the inside, but that I is in there because of the negative, okay? The whole square root, yes. So you can put it either after the three, like because if three were a coefficient, or you can put it on the very, very back. Formally, you're supposed to put it in the very, very back. I just don't. That's like the one thing I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm resistant against. Everything else, I'm like, oh, I like it the formal way. It should be done the formal way, but this is the one where I don't like the formal way. Um, 13 and 14, it's just a matter of plugging in negative one for I squared and then putting it in the correct order, okay? If I have one in my workbook to practice, I do not. So let me practice one of those, okay? So I'm gonna do this this extra problem. Um, this is negative nine I plus I squared and they want it in standard form. So this is an extra problem. It wasn't given to me, it's just from the homework and I wanna to try to do it, okay? So if you have one like this, you just need to plug in that this is a negative one. And what do you get when you have plus a negative? It just becomes a big negative or minus, right? But that's not in the standard form because the I part's supposed to be at the back, right? So you just put negative one in front and then the negative nine I in the back. And now this is the standard form. So there's two problems like that in the homework. You just, wherever the I squared is, put a negative one in parentheses and then do the combining of the signs, okay? Let's see, these are about adding and subtracting. So we definitely wanna try, there's three problems on adding and subtracting. And I'm pretty sure there was some practice. Yeah. So number two is seven minus I minus six minus I. And I think I'm gonna throw in an extra one for the adding and subtracting. Because one of those problems in the homework looked a little, a little strange. So like number 15 looks pretty normal, right? You're adding them. So you, essentially when you uh, distribute the plus, nothing changes, everything's all still positive. The bottom one's more like 16 is more like ours. Um, even 18 is not so bad. You distribute the positive and then you just have this 13i at the end to add up, okay? That one's not too bad. But 17 does look a little bit different from the problem we're about to practice. So I do want to do a problem like number 17, okay? So let's go look at one that looks like a normal add or subtract. And that's this guy right here. So essentially there's nothing to distribute in the front there. So you don't need these parentheses in them anymore. It's just seven minus I. But you do have a negative that you need to distribute here. So when I do that, I'm gonna end up with a negative six I but then I'm actually gonna end up with a positive I. And then the positive I and the negative I actually cancel in this particular problem. Only because one's positive, one's minus, and there's the same number of them, right? And then seven minus six is just one. So I just get a real answer, which is one. Completely coincidental, okay? Most times when you add or subtract in complex numbers, you end up with a complex number. But this one conveniently canceled out the imaginary part. Okay, similarly, we can do that extra problem, but the extra one I noticed looked a little bit more complicated. So let me go back to number 17 and write this problem down. 
So negative two plus square root of negative eight, and then five minus square root of negative 56. So that one looks a little bit longer than the other one. It's not in its standard form yet, is it? It's not a number plus another number with an eye hanging out. So we have to first get them to look like standard form, and then maybe I can do the combining like terms, okay? So I do need to know eight. Eight is two times four, which is two times two. 56 is two times 28, two times 14, two times seven. So that means this becomes negative one, and then two, two, two. And then the 56 is negative one, two, 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 and seven. Okay, so this one is gonna come out as an I, and then I need a group because it's a square root, right? So we need two in order to come out. Here we know the one is gonna come out as an I, and we need a group of two in order to come out. So I'm gonna have two and an I, and a two left over inside. Five minus, and two and an I, but I have both of these guys left over over here. So that's gonna make a 14. Now, there's nothing really to distribute for either of them because here there's nothing in the front on the first parentheses. So you really don't need those parentheses. As long as there's no coefficient in the front to distribute and no exponent, on a term that has parentheses around it, you don't need those parentheses, okay? As long as there's no number in front and no power, no parentheses. This one has like an imaginary positive one there. So I do have to distribute that to make the parentheses go away. But a positive times a positive is positive. Positive times a negative is negative. It doesn't really change the values of anything. If it were negative though, right, it would change the signs of it. Okay, now we group. So I'm gonna put my real numbers together. What is negative two plus five? What is it? Mm -hmm, positive three. Now this one, unfortunately, you can't combine them because in order for them to be like terms, not only do they have to have the eyes the same, but they also have to have the radicands the same. And notice this one has a two inside the radical and then this one has a 14 inside the radical. So I can't really put them together, but somehow they want me to write this in um, standard form, right? With the I off to the side. So when you do that, the way to write it is to put a plus sign here. It always has to be a plus sign. So I'm gonna try to darken it, okay? Always put the plus sign there. And then you're gonna take this term here that has an I in it, and you're gonna put a positive two square root of two. And then you're gonna do the other term that has an I in it. And since it's minus, I'm gonna do minus two square root of 14. And then you're gonna put the I on the side, okay? So if I were to do the right-handed distribution, right? You would get these two terms up top, right? If I do distribute here, you get that term. If I distribute there, you get this term. So these lines are equivalent, okay? But that's how you would write it in its standard form. Standard. So that one was tricky because those little radicals don't combine. Most of the time we get nice things that do combine, but I guess they always like to throw you for a loop. Let's <laughs> see if you catch it. Okay, now we're gonna get into the multiplication. So we already know we just foil it like normal. If it's just one thing, you just distribute it. If it's two things, you foil it out. If it's got a square, you foil it out with itself, 
right? So make sure you write it twice and then foil it out. Um, and then this is the one where it starts asking about the conjugates. I think we have some of those. So let's go ahead and multiply this out and then we'll even divide, which it hasn't gotten to yet in the homework, but we will do that. So let's see, number three. Three plus nine I squared. So regardless if you're foiling or just distributing, multiplication is exactly the same as it was the first, first class session, okay? So because there's a square, I have to write it twice. And then I'm just gonna foil like I normally do. So I have this guy times that guy, and then times the other guy. And then these two. And then the last two. And so I get these four terms. The only difference between this section and what we've done in the past is that they're not X's, right? They're I's. And so when you get an I squared, you have to put in negative one. Okay. That's the only big difference here. It's this part right here. And then once you do that, I'm gonna group it. I'm gonna put the real number and then that's gonna make a negative 81 real number. And then I'll put the eyes together in the back. What is that? I think it's negative 72, but I always wanna be sure. Yeah, negative 72. And I think that's 54, yes. So I'm just combining my like terms. And that's it. I can't do anything else with it. And it is in its little standard form, right? Real number plus the imaginary number. So it's done. So I, before we go into the division, I do want to do some extra problems from the homework. And it's about finding those conjugates, OK? Because the way they word it and then the way they give you the numbers is it can be confusing. Okay, so we're gonna make sure that we talk it out um, before you go try to do the homework. And I think we do still have a few more minutes, so we're should be doing okay. Yeah, we're doing okay on time. We might have one other practice outside these extra ones. Okay, not that I want from homework. There we go. So one plus square root of 18, square root of three, and then the last two are the um, division, the last three, four, five. Ooh, and I wanna do that one too. Okay. Before I continue with these, does anybody know what the conjugate of four minus nine I is. What is the conjugate of that? Four plus nine I. What is the conjugate of one minus I? One plus I. What is the conjugate of nine minus I? Nine plus I. What is the conjugate of positive I? Negative I, yes. And I'm gonna explain real quick before I do this. So if I have I, that can be as if I have no real part and I just have one of the imaginary parts, right? That is what I could force it to look like if I wanted to force it into standard form, right? And so if you're talking about the conjugate, conjugate, you're only changing this sign in the middle, right? So it becomes zero minus one I, which is the same as just negative. So the conjugate of i is negative i. Whoever said that, you got it. What about two i? What's the conjugate of that? Negative two i. Because again, it's like a zero in the front and you just same change the sign in the, in the middle, right? So it becomes plus two i. And then these two, I do have that example at the bottom. So for the first one, it wants me to know the conjugate. 
a first thing I need to do is simplify this radical and if you type it in your calculator, you will get three square root of two. That's because 18 is two times three times three. Three's come out of the root, right? Or you can just type it in here Oops. and it should simplify it for you, okay? Now it's asking me for the conjugate. And so remember the radical part is the part that changes sign. So the one will stay the same and this just becomes minus three squared two. Same thing here. I can force this to be in standard form, but it would be zero plus and then the radical part. So then what's the conjugate? I'm spelling this right, wrong. Conjugate, yes. I hate this word. <laughs> Okay, so what would be the conjugate of that one then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be zero minus that, right? But you don't really need to write zero, so it'd just be minus. So tricky, those two, which is why I wanted to talk about them. So it's better to rewrite what they gave you first and then pick out the conjugate, okay? Now, this one was a last, last problem in the, um, the last one in the homework that I wanted to do before the division. So you do, you have to be careful. This was a negative. You have properties that tell you that you can multiply the insides with the insides, right? on our radical properties, we had a property like that. But those properties, if you remember back in the details of them, those properties only applied to real numbers, okay? Those properties did not apply to imaginary numbers. If I have a negative inside the square root, this is an imaginary number. And because there's a negative inside that radical, this is an imaginary number as well. So I cannot just say that this equals the square root of negative seven times negative 14. I cannot do that, okay? However, what you can do is you can take the negative out as an I, take out this negative as an I. These guys are multiplied together. So where that dot in the middle came from, okay? And then I can multiply the outsides with the outsides. And now, because what is inside is now positive, it's now a real square root. And since I'm doing the square root of a positive seven and the square root of a positive 14, now I can apply that property that allows me to take the insides times the inside, okay? And so I can do it like this. But I couldn't have done that without taking the minuses out first, okay? You have to take those minuses out first. So this negative one is, or I'm sorry, <laughs> this negative I squared is gonna become a negative one. And then in here, I'm actually gonna break up that 14. You could do it differently. You could just do square root of seven times 14 in your calculator. And it will blast out the final, final answer, okay? But I broke this up and then I'm gonna take this out. So I have negative one times seven, with the two left over. So notice whether you did this step or not, you still should get to that bottom line, right? And then it's just a matter of multiplying these two outsides together to get the final answer there. And notice if I had done it wrong, okay? If I had done it wrong and applied that rule to two imaginary numbers that I'm not allowed to apply, if I had done it wrong, you would have gotten the square root of, oh, what is that, 98, positive 98. And so then if I type that in the calculator, you'll notice that it pops out this. Notice that that's not the same as the correct answer, right? Okay, so that's why we tell you, don't do that when they're imaginary. Take out the eyes first, and then the insides are no longer imaginary. 
Okay. An imaginary times an imaginary is going to give you negative. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, now I need to do a division. Where am I on time? I have nine minutes. That's good enough for a division. So for division, really, the only thing you're doing is multiplying by the conjugate of the bottom. Now, whether there's one term at the top or two terms at the top, it really doesn't matter. You multiply whatever you have, okay? So if I were doing problem 29, my conjugate would be negative 2i, right? Like we said. So you would be basically distributing a negative 2i on the top and then just multiplying by a negative 2i downstairs. And then be sure that you change all your i squareds into negative ones and simplify it, okay? Same thing here, the conjugate of i is negative i, so I'd multiply that on top and bottom, simplify it. This one's um, not exactly like ours because notice it has two terms on top, right? So once I multiply by nine plus i, I'm gonna have to foil it at the top and I'm gonna have to foil it at the bottom because there's two and two, right? Here though, when I multiply by the conjugate one minus i, conjugate would be one plus i, I will have to foil downstairs because downstairs there'll be two and two, right? But up top, it'll just be 15 times one plus i. So I'll just have to distribute on the top, okay? And then the same thing with this one. If I multiply by the bottom's conjugate, that's four plus nine i. So at the top, all I'm doing is distributing a three, but at the bottom, I have to actually foil it out, okay? So that, those uh, 25 and 26 are a lot like the problem that we have. So this is the problem in the practice. And so I do have to use the conjugate of the bottom. So then what would I be multiplying by? Six plus seven I, good. And whatever you do to the bottom, you have to do it to the top so that you're not changing the value, right? You're just multiplying by a really weird looking one. So what I end up with is I have to distribute this two And at the bottom, I've got to foil all of that out because I have two terms times two terms. So six times six is 36. Six times that guy is 42i. Negative seven i times six is negative 42i. And then negative seven i times positive seven i is negative 49 i squared. And so I do have to change those i squareds into negative ones. And I could have canceled up there, but I didn't. But if you notice the 42i and negative 42i, they do cancel. I could have canceled them up there and not wrote them down in my next line. For some reason, my hand did not do that. So it's okay. Cancel them now. And what will I end up with? I'm gonna have 49 here, but what sign is gonna go in the middle? Right, because the negative and the negative, good. And so let's see, 36 plus 49 is 85. So then I get 12 over 85 and 14 over 85 with the I on the side. I'm gonna double check. 12 over 85 does not reduce. Notice it stayed the same. And then 14 over 85 also does not reduce. It just stayed the same, okay? So that means this is the final, final answer. If it can be reduced, you should reduce it before you put it up here, okay? So always double check. You just type in the fraction and it will reduce it if it does in fact reduce. Uh, we've got five minutes. Do you want to try to do one of the ones that just had like one term downstairs? Okay, do you want to do the one with the I or the one with the two I? Two I? Okay, let me write down number 29. Um, six plus 12 I over two I. Okay, so for this one, what is the conjugate for this one? Negative 2i, because only the imaginary part changes sign, right? When you're doing the conjugate. 
So then notice here, you're gonna have two guys times one guy, right? So this is what they call right-handed distribution. Like it's going from the right over, okay? So I get negative 12i and I get negative 24i squared. And at the bottom, I'm gonna get negative four and an i squared. And so just like the other one, we have to change the i squared to negative ones. And so then if I combine those double signs, this negative and that negative will make it plus 24. And at the bottom, negative four and negative one will make it a positive four. And then I'm gonna separate. So just give, put each one, each term. I always put eyes on the sides of the fractions, right? Because that's what it's supposed to look like in that standard form. And so negative 12 over four is just negative three i, and then 24 over four is just six. But is that in standard form? Mm -mm. The i's are supposed to be in the back, right? So it has to go positive six in front and then the minus three i. And now it's in standard form. Okay, I'm going to, we have like one or two minutes, we have like three minutes, yay. <laughs> um, before I go, I'm gonna just mention again that um, tonight you want to do your 1.5 homework and then you want to do the review. I'm gonna go open the review real quick so we have like one or two minutes just to kind of scan through it a little bit. Um, and there are going to be 10 questions on this test just like there were on the last test. So they're not real big tests, once we get to like unit three, four, and five, there might be more than 10 problems. But for these smaller ones, 10 is a lot. Okay. Even for unit one, I don't even think there's 10 because that's literally only covering two sections. So that test is like real short too. Okay. Um, so make sure you do 1.5 homework and review. Let me go open the review. There we go. So we're going to talk about those two methods. And then that was the biggest thing. So whether you're online student or whether you're face-to-face, -face, there were quite a few people, not just one person, it was like a handful of people. So I got a bunch of points taken off on this last test because when it came to factoring, instead of actually like using a method of factoring, you guys were like checking the answers that were given, right? And that's not following the directions. Um, this test is gonna be the same um, amount of weight on those directions as well, because you learn some uh, different methods to solving equations and you have to demonstrate that you understand those different methods of solving equations. So if the problems in the test say solve doing it this way, you have to solve it doing that way. You can always, do it the other way you like and check your answer, right? You'd be like, oh, I'm supposed to get five and two, but am I getting it five and two doing it the way I'm supposed to do it, right? Um, but you have to do it whatever the directions say, okay? Otherwise, you that's what I consider a major misconception. Like you don't even know what it's telling you, asking you to do, right? If you're not able to follow those directions. So that's not good. <laughs> so make sure you follow. So notice how this one says follow, uh, solve by extracting the roots. So you're not gonna minus the 64 over, get it equal to zero and factor it and study factor to zero because that's the method of factoring, okay? That's not the method of extracting roots. The method of extracting roots was to take the square root of both sides and you get plus or minus, right? Whatever that value is. You make sure you're applying the correct um, thing. This one says, make sure you do it by completing the square. So essentially your job is to make that problem look like this and then you can do extracting roots. That's what the process of completing the square is. You make it look like something squared equal to a number and then continue extracting. Um, I think there might even be some later down that say solve it using the quadratic formula, but I think we wait on that one until we talk about imaginaries because you do get imaginaries negatives inside that square root. 
And then the rest of this section is all about simplifying those radicals. Some of these your calculator will do for you. If it says without a calculator, that's when you have to show me like those quantities and how you're grouping the numbers out and stuff like that. If it's specifically saying without a calculator. Notice on all the stuff we were doing with imaginaries, it never said anything about without the calculator, okay? So you know that if I put the little I out, the negative out as an I, I could type the rest of it in my calculator and figure out the rest of it, okay? That's not a problem. It's only these specifically say that a calculator you need to use the rules. Okay, um, so pay attention to those all those little directions. Use the properties inside times inside and reduce. Um, and then the radical form, being able to turn that into um, a fraction exponent. Dun, dun, dun. So look over this whole, and then here you go with the eyes, adding them, subtracting them, multiplying them, giving me a conjugate, and then dividing them out. Um, and then it does say use the quadratic formula, but I believe in this one, you're not gonna end up with imaginaries. And this one says solve using the quadratic formula, but you don't end up with imaginaries because the imaginary solutions are on the next, um, the next test, okay? So try it, try it, try it. I know we're running out of time. Um, and then however you do, you do. So we can ask questions in the next class. I'm gonna stop recording.